All right. I think we are uh, going to get started now. Hopefully everyone has their coffee intake. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining and carving out some time out of your busy days. I know uh, with COVID and everything going on, every might, everyone might have some Zoom fatigue, but um, I, I think you guys are in for a special treat today. So today we have a special guest and a topic that I'm actually really excited about. Um, on this session today, we are joined by Mitch Pierce, who is a solution architect at JR Simplot, as well as Alex Gamble from SailPoint, who's the director of the SAP program. Today, we'll be hearing from Mitch Pierce as he shares his journey and insight of JR Simplot's Q1 2020 go live of a global S4 HANA rollout. Please note, if you have any questions, please submit via the Q&A feature. Uh, you can see it at the bottom of the little chat log there. Um, we will be able to answer all the questions at the end of the session, or if there's a really relevant question, we can actually answer those questions live. Um, but first, I will pass it over to Alex Campbell as he speaks to why identity governance is a vital tool in the rollout. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Morgan, and appreciate everyone joining today uh, live here with us, as well as those who will join on, on demand. You know, regardless of where you are in your journey to S4 HANA, or even to the cloud, it's important to maintain effective control over your identity and access governance initiatives. During my time working on SAP implementation projects, one of the common issues I saw was that many organizations tended to ignore the other applications within their technology ecosystem, and that led to a lot of problems. SailPoint eliminates many of those issues by providing centralized 360 degree views for your application infrastructure assets, and that enables secure user lifecycle management, business level user certifications, and clear identity focused audit trails. And it's all wrapped into a world class user experience uh, that's, that's evidenced by the magic quadrant uh, leadership that we've, we've shown over the last years as you're witnessing here on this slide. Regardless of your deployment methodology during your move to S4, SailPoint can actively manage your entire technology ecosystem all while supporting and enabling your overarching governance risk and compliance strategy. With that, I'm happy to turn it over to Mitch with GR Simplot. Mitch? Thank you, Alex. Um, well, good morning or good afternoon. Um, my name is Mitch Pierce and I'm a solution architect for the JR Simplot company. The JR Simplot company is a global agribusiness company headquartered in Boise, Idaho that services our customers from dirt to the dinner table in more than 60 countries. We have operations in over six countries focused primarily on food processing and phosphate based fertilizers with smaller businesses in life sciences, biotechnology, and genetics. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about our journey and plan to consolidate our systems, standardize processes where it makes sense, and a re-implementation of SailPoint Identity IQ. Simplot's journey to implement identity and access management started about five years ago. Simplot purchased SailPoint IIQ, but we didn't focus on the processes, data, and governance required to make it successful. We underfunded the effort and did not end up, ended up not provisioning a single account. In 2018-19, we started a global initiative to implement a global HR solution and look to standardize processes and eliminate systems providing, that provided the same capability. This laid the foundation to look at where IAM can be positioned and the value that IIQ could bring. The effort was relaunched with a commitment to deliver operational improvements and benefits to manage the business and better manage risk. After much assessment, Simplot launched our project Bedrock in mid 2019. This was an effort, this, this effort was to establish a solid foundation and position the company for global growth. This effort was initiated and sponsored from the top down. The Simplot family, as we're a private company, the board of directors, all the C-level executives and directors across the company were on board. Simplot planned for three waves of implementation over five years, touching all business capabilities. From an IT perspective, system consolidation to SAP systems was fundamental. In wave one, we would implement global HR on SAP success factors and lay an SAP S4 HANA foundation with global finance. For this project, we chose to scrap our SailPoint IIQ 7.3 uh, instance 
and start over and implement IIQ 8.0 to support eight connected applications and two active directories. SAP success factors would be our authoritative source, SAP S4 HANA, our core ERP system, and we would use GRC, SAP GRC to conduct all segregation of duty checks. Additionally, we would support two active directories, one of them being our global active directory and another active directory supporting our Asia Pacific region. Now, why IIQ over SAP IDM when we were going all in with SAP? We have over 500 applications across all of our diverse business units globally and with a goal to reduce and simplify where it makes sense. IIQ provided many out of the box connectors and the ability um, to interface to many, if not most of the applications um, that were not branded SAP. The project had all of our major systems integrating with over 24 on-premise and cloud SAP applications over the next three waves. Simplot chose a global SAP implementation partner. And this project had over 75 Simplot staff, 120 of our SI consultants paging in and out of the project. And for the IAM project, we had a team of six to implement IIQ. We chose integral partners as our partner to implement IIQ globally in wave one. At this time, I'd like to introduce this team who's on the phone with us today. From Simplot, uh, Lisa Letelier, Senior Director of Enterprise Architecture, Phil Miller, Director of Information Security, were our executive sponsors. Mary Jo Foster was our primary engineer and Yolanda Stockton was our QA analyst. However, Yolanda played many other roles other than just QA. From Integral Partners, Fred Morton was assigned as project manager. Mukesh Yadav was the primary solution architect and developer and Brandon Bullen was an engineer developer. Yes, we were a small, but we called ourselves a pretty nimble team. Now our project started in July of 2019 with a target go live of February 2nd, 2020. Seven months to design and implement IIQ to support all of our SAP systems. The IA team operated on the periphery of the main project, which was really focused on SAP. Communication across the teams was, and still is, really critical. In September, the IAM team defined the possible use cases of where IIQ played, in, uh, played and created some high-level plans to address joiners, movers, leavers, access requests, and, and essentially everything for the lifecycle management. At the same time, we defined, I actually presented to our executive steering committee and defined what success would look like once implemented. And you see on the date of this slide, it was presented in September of 19. And we committed to ultimately IIQ needed to deliver on our commitments. Success for IIQ would have our business users requesting SAP access, our managers and role owners approving that access, and the managers certifying contingent or contract workers every 60 days. IIQ would provision and deprovision all Active Directory accounts from our authoritative source success factors. All SAP accounts and entitlements would be provisioned by IIQ. Our support organization would be embracing and supporting IIQ processes, and we would be all already positioning for bedrock wave two, the next wave. We had a commitment to retire applications that provided duplicate capabilities in Asia PAC and US for provisioning and create a uh, first draft roadmap of what it would look like beyond wave one. Now I smile every time I see our roadmap. Um, Fred, you know all, this all too well as well. It was not a straight line roadmap. Um, this version shows the significance and importance of the coordination across teams to hit our milestone delivery dates. And this wasn't trivial. For example, uh, if, you, if you can pick out uh, where GRC dev build, the, pro the SAP project had GRC scheduled to be built August 26th. Now they hit their timeline of, of creating the, the build, but by no means did that mean they had the policies in place the, to actually cause a policy or risk violation on an identity and be able to process the SOD check correctly. It wasn't until late December that 
we were able to actually connect to a GRC system with real identities or, or test identities as we were migrating up through the environments and really start testing GRC and its full capabilities. Um, now this put us behind some of our milestones, but it also meant that we had to be nimble enough to move some of our other tasks earlier on in the project to adjust this accordingly. Now on February 2nd of this year, 2020, we went live with IAQ 8.0 P1. It was connected to nine SAP applications, two active directories, and providing interfaces for two more. We delivered a minimal viable product required, the, the minimal viable product required, and IAQ is now provisioning and deprovisioning counts perform, and performing access requests for all of the entitlements for the SAP connected applications. Internally to Simplot, we had to communicate up and down through our, the, the organizational levels as well. We branded IIQ to our users as My Identity or My ID. And this slide was an actual slide that was used by our CIO to the board, as well as I use this in training as we talk to the, the business role owners. Um, success factors was our authoritative source. We would create and disable accounts. We would enable self-service for the SAP applications, and we would even allow managers to certify their non-Simplot employees. Now in January, uh, right before go live, um, as a solution architect, I also delivered the foundations or directional um, direction of what a next, what our roadmap would look like. Um, this included staying current or current stable on a version of IIQ and onboarding key strategic applications while looking at our bedrock wave two and all the SAP applications. This plan also included upgrading immediately to 8.0 P2 as it contained SailPoint ETN fixes um, that we had logged bugs in during our project for the success factors connector. Then in March, um, as Morgan mentioned, as we all know, COVID hit. Now what this did across the company, strategically Simplot paused all of our strategic programs, including putting a pause on our bedrock program. Now what that meant for us as an IAM team is we quickly adjusted our roadmap for IAQ accordingly to take the opportunity and try to focus on global process improvements and onboarding a couple of key strategic applications. As such, um, we are engaged right now working with integral partners to onboard and integrate one of our strategic CRM applications. IIQ continues to have support across Simplot, even with the slow of projects. We continue, we have plans to upgrade this fall, possibly look at Linux and containerization and really try to improve our deployment, optimi uh, our, optimize our deployment processes. And to maintain this progress and support, it's been real key to maintain partnerships across the organization. We partner with our enterprise architecture team, information security, our internal audit team, our support organization is critical, as well as senior leadership to keep them in the loop and make sure they understand what value we're bringing and what we can and can't do. Now the next two slides, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the challenges that we faced. Um, as you saw in the roadmap, the roadmap was up and down and not a straight line and we did face many challenges. Um, at Go Live, we actually, um, on our go live weekend faced data challenges coming from our authoritative source. Some of the design decisions that we had made throughout the entire project and we had coded IIQ to birthright business roles too. We, uh, we used a value called AD type. Um, a quick story when we, um, we were in our cutover weekend and uh, we received a call from the security desk saying they lost access to their systems. Um, we then started receiving uh, or hearing through third parties that we, um, some of the Deloitte contractors who were there cutting over our, into our SAP systems had also lost access. Well, little did we know that the decisions that were made to look at that AD type, which essentially determined what type of Microsoft licensing we were assigning or birthrighting into their roles, had not been fully vetted across all contractors. And we were removing the access of the contractors actually cutting uh, SI partners, cutting us over at, at, at real life. 
Well, we had to stop, put together a plan, roll back some of the core decisions that we had made and re-implement, basically re-aggregate all of the identities back in. That was just one example. Um, at uh, right after Go Live, uh, we learned a lot about contingent worker management. We learned that the data that was loaded into success factors at Go Live isn't the same data that the managers were, were entering or were, were required to enter when they put a contractor in. Um, and then we learned that work orders on contingent workers drive terminations um, just as much as a, the, um, going in and immediately terminating them. We had process challenges that Simplot managed our user, uh, many of our user accounts in access by exception. Um, when we put automation in, it wasn't shortly th thereafter that we learned or that we would receive calls saying, but what about this user? How do I set up this one user? And when we, <clears throat> through automation, it's not as easy to manage exceptions. And we didn't address that uh, earlier and we probably should have. Um, global standards had not been fully defined, or I should say fully adopted. So we may have had standards out there, but until they were being enforced by a, by a system like IIQ, it doesn't drive, it didn't drive the adoption across Simplot. We had many different people across the globe creating accounts and they would do them a little bit differently. And we're still working on continuing to improve our, our processes around global standardization. Uh, we had issues uh, with other systems that were reliant upon our Active Directory data. And it wasn't, we knew we were going to have these problems, but it was what we didn't know at the time. We didn't know what systems were using what, what data. And, um, and so we would have, you know, it wasn't shortly too long after that we received a call from Australia saying, hey, we're taking some information out of the Active Directory that changed. Can we get it put back? And our answer was no, let's work on a future state of here's the information we have available. How do we want to position it into an attribute to, to move forward? And then data analysis and cleanup has been very slow and tedious. Um, you'll see in a future slide, we're, we're continuing to focus on our identity data. And again, we want a solid foundation to build upon moving forward. On the technology side, we did not have a development active directory in place. Now we simulated development by using non-production organizational units and OUs, but in the end, and especially as we went to go live, um, there's nothing like having a true development environment that simulates prod, um, and, uh, and, and that, that's important. Um, we actually are still working around some of the process issues that uh, through our design, we said we were going to update all business phone numbers and success factors from Active Directory. Well, we waited on P2 um, from SailPoint. We immediately um, installed P or upgraded to P2. That fixed our ability to update business phone numbers. However, we quickly though learned that some of the dependencies that success factors had in place, such as an is primary flag, which is part of a business phone number, but a separate field uh, was in place that if a phone number wasn't put in, it didn't allow us to go in, it didn't allow us to update it. And so we're still working on some of those processes. And then infrastructure and uh, scalability. Um, we learned a lot after go live. Um, we started slow. We, we went live and we were provisioning, aggregating and refreshing data, uh, provisioning accounts once per day. We quickly had a plan to scale up after go live the first week to two times per day. And we had a request or, um, uh, uh, across the company to say they wanted us to create and provision or deprovision accounts every hour. Now, for those of you running IIQ, you know the load and the complexities that puts on a system. And since we've landed on every three hours, we're provisioning, deprovisioning accounts. Um, so aggregating all of, our, all of our connected applications and then doing a complete refresh. We also learned that uh, pieces of the infrastructure ecosystem that uh, we thought we had enough, uh, say something as simple as disk space, uh, we didn't. Uh, we were doing a lot of logging for the first month, month and a half, and we ended up um, filling up or maxing out our server disks for syslog data, and we quickly had to adopt for that. So, you know, we, in hindsight, we probably should have looked a little bit more trying to te uh, test or even try to scale up the data in our lower environments. And then on the people side, 
I, I kind of smile at this one because we went live. We didn't remove a lot of the base functionality in IIQ because we know that we want to implement it and it's on the roadmap to implement the functionality. However, what we didn't expect, users being users, when a manager went in to approve an access request, they would start playing around in the system. And in February, March, we had managers trying to disable their own employees, disable user accounts. We had managers trying to immediately do password resets on their employees. And uh, we, we had talked about this, but we, um, we didn't expect that to uh, the users to be as uh, inquisitive as they were across the system. Now, some of the lessons learned, again, in that process, uh, people in technology buckets, um, you know, as a big project like this, best laid plans changed. Um, we, you know, a good example, we reacted, we rolled back, but even some of the design decisions that we made um, as far as a plan for our rehire process, we have since completely refactored our rehire process. Um, and uh, as we learned that quite a few of our workers are seasonal workers and they want their same accounts back. And uh, for us to do that, depending again on the timing of when they come into our HR system, how they're rehired, how the hiring manager and HR works within the system determines the time of when they become active and even who gets notified with the, with the uh, link for credentials. Um, so those plans that we had put in place through the project, we are still adapting to, to changing those. We learned that we had hard dependencies on other project teams that impacted our timeline. Um, I gave the example of GRC, but uh, we, you know, we were moving through a, uh, a plan where we had a, had a dev environment, a QA environment, and a production environment, each with four servers each. Um, and in November, we found that the implementation team, because they were doing a greenfield implementation of SAP, they were moving from their QA environment into a UAT environment. We did not expect that, and it put us scrambling um, to, to figure out what to do and how we were going to mirror the SAP environments. And so in about a period of two weeks, we stood up another four servers for UAT connected to all of our connected applications, and we just didn't expect that. So these little things really impacted our timeline. As a project team, uh, we were working in a, a new tool to manage our workflow. Uh, we were using, and still are using, Azure DevOps. It was, we were a little slow to embrace it because we were all learning the process of managing work items, uh, creating the pull requests into the repos and so forth. Um, but now we're so reliant upon it and glad that we have it in place. Um, you know, a lack of understanding across the entire Bedrock team of what IIQ did, does, and doesn't do. Um, although we were communicating at the project levels um, as far as the status of what we did and that, sometimes it didn't get down to the actual people doing the work. So creating relationships with the people actually doing the configuration on SAP has been, uh, like GRC, has been just vital to make sure. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, I probably would have um, done a little bit more to actually talk directly, to, more directly to, and more indirectly to the people who were actually doing the configuration on the teams. And then a better understanding of what applications or parts of provisioning um, IIQ should, when we on, should do when we onboard. Um, early on, I committed to uh, take on the, to manage the entitlements for SAP Ariba. Little did I know that, um, the users would be provisioned from a completely different SAP system and we were expected to, to manage the entitlements. And when you have a, a file going into SAP that the user has a different set of users than what we send for the entitlements, you're just, it was bound for problems. So as we move forward, I'm not gonna consider onboarding applications into IIQ unless we're able to look at the entire provisioning process and look at the users as well as the entitlements across the board. Um, on the people side, as we cut over, you know, we, we had people on, we had our whole team on call because it was a, a, as a global uh, rollout and we did not have an AD admin on site. Um, now they were on call, but they weren't on site and we did a lot of testing and, but through all of our testing, we did not have to expect to roll back and, and manage some active directory accounts. So, you know, have the, the, the team in place on site with you there. 
At STEM Club, we relied uh, heavily on integral partners, and I'm so grateful to Makesh, Fred, and the team for the partnership that they showed us and the commitment that they showed us uh, through our project. Um, we, I probably should have set a stronger strategy and set of expectations around our own team roles earlier in the project. Huge kudos and a call out to um, Mary Jo Foster, um, because the deployment process that we managed through the project implementation, if you can picture having four environments, dev, QA, UAT, and prod, each with four servers, with as rapidly as we were changing configurations and codes, we could not have done it without her. And so a big call out to her. And then uh, same with Yolanda Stockton on the, on the, on the uh, testing. Uh, her attention to detail is second to none. Um, and then a lack of understanding on the resourcing effort required post go live. <clears throat> um, I realized in January that our statement of work with Interval um, expired at, at go live and we hadn't planned enough um, hours to support the product post go live. There was some hope, I think, and an understanding that we would have enough knowledge internal to do that. Um, within Simplot, but the fact was is the amount of work that came in after go live in some ways was just as much yet different than what we went what we managed at go live itself. And so we quickly re-engaged with the integral our integral got a new statement of work and and uh, really used them heavily to uh, optimize and address some of the some of the challenges that we were seeing. And then, as I touched base earlier on the technology side, have a, uh, an Active Directory in place, or in a nutshell, just have everything that you're going to, what you're going to look like in prod in your lower environments if you can. Now, we went live on February 2nd, as mentioned, and we've since grown 11,000 total identities. Uh, we are six months live and we've had a strong push on the data, but we have a long way to go. We're aggregating and refreshing every three hours. And I think we're maintaining a really high level of service for the creation and termination of accounts and our error rate for provisioning as well as our synch synchronizing errors are down under a 10th of a percent. And of that 10th of a percent, we know almost every one of them what they are. Um, this is uh, functionality that uh, P2 and 8.1 actually corrects. We just have not implemented it yet and it's on our roadmap to do, do so. Now, as I go into the question and answer, um, I'd like to take a minute and probably go a little bit off script here. Um, many times, um, you know, it's too easy to buy a product or get caught up in the sales stuff early on and think that the product's gonna solve everything. But in the case of IIQ um, in Simplot, um, it wasn't the product. It was the product ended up being just a framework, um, a framework to the processes and the people, um, both in a support capacity and in a delivery capacity across the company. Um, I'm very appreciative to Simplot leadership um, and the support that they've shown to uh, our project and our team and the team. And I think we're off to a great journey ahead. So with that, I'm going to. Can go ahead and open it up to questions. Great, thank you, Mitch. And we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, everyone, if you, if you do want to submit a question, please submit it through the Q and A box, uh, and we'll answer it. So, Mitch, the first question actually, and if you wanted to go back uh, on the on the last side, was why was there such a big growth in the inactive accounts over time? Oh, that's a that's a great question. So yeah, you can see we went live with uh, 20, 21,000, we're now at 32,000, and our inactive accounts went from about 200 to 14,000. Now the growth in IDs, the first thing I wanna note is the growth in IDs aren't one for one. And as I mentioned, we manage such a large contingent, um, or both a contingent workforce, as well as a seasonal workforce, what happened between February and today is our HR department has loaded a lot of historical data into success factors. Um, even the load of data, um, you know, you can see that growth in the April time, the March, April, May time period caused some challenges for us as they loaded some data because um, a lot of the times we weren't expecting it to be loaded. So primarily, uh, Morgan, it's, it's the data loaded um, and go live 
are we scaled up, loaded our inactive or terminated users, so we have the ability to then rehire them, establish do they have connected accounts, and reprovision or re-enable those accounts accordingly. Great, appreciate that, Mitch. Okay, hey, so we have another question uh, that came in. Um, so the question states, it's mentioned that SAP GRC was used for provisioning and SOD checks. SOD checks, I get. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the provisioning and what was shared between IIQ and GRC as there seems to be some overlap in the activities? And I'm gonna jump back a couple of slides here. Um, let's see if I can get to it here real quick. So, so we chose uh, for the SAP connected applications and you see the bottom process flow here shows us having uh, the workflow that we built out having a a first level manager approval and a business role owner approval separated by a, a, an SOD check within SAP. The, the way that the, uh, we've chosen, and, and we had some discussion early on, but it very quickly swayed to use GRC versus try to use the, uh, the policies and the, uh, the ability within IIQ, is it really let us manage the SAP users at a very granular role with a controls team in place and, the, and the, um, the controls in place within GRC to manage those. As we bring on other um, connected applications, we will hope to implement some policy checking or enforcement uh, segregation of duties checking within IIQ. However, it, it really being an SAP ecosystem, it just made sense there. So what we're doing is we're passing the identity information over to um, GRC with the roles of, um, of what the user has. And uh, actually GRC knows what role the user has, the users have across, uh, across all the connected applications as well, as well. It goes through the policy checking and then passes back to IIQ. If it finds a risk, it passes back that, um, the risk as well as we're collecting the risk ID number because the risk in, in GRC must be mitigated before we can approve and provision the account. So what? So if GRC denies it and, and that risk is not approved, we then don't provision the account and it goes to a denied status and we end it. If it, if it is approved, we get all of the GRC notes on what the risk was, what the mitigation was, we collect that in our audit log and then go ahead with the provisioning of the account. Great, appreciate that, Mitch. Okay, we have a, a, another question that came in. How does Simplot deal with access for contingent workers or contractors? Is Fuel Glass part of the HR lifecycle for these folks? Oh, um, so today, um, and I'm, I'm smiling a little bit on that one, we're managing our entire contingent workforce in success factors. Uh, we, put them in as a contingent employee. Uh, we have two different types, an employee and a contingent worker type. And we create contingent worker work orders for every one of the contractors. The, the real answer, yes, field glass is absolutely part of the SAP ecosystem. It's just at this time, Simplot has not chosen to implement field glass as part of our solution. Um, because we don't have field glass, it does cre create some unique challenges for managing contingent workers, but we're working with our HR team, with the business to, to try to mitigate some of, uh, some of that work, because it's, it's much different putting them into a core, uh, core HR system than using field glass, which um, manages uh, contractors and contingent workers by default. So that's a great question. We just have not chosen to implement it yet. Okay, great. And I think that is all of the questions we have currently have. If you guys have a question, uh, please submit it in the next 30 seconds. If not, I think we can wrap things up here. So we'll give it a, a couple more seconds if anybody has a question. Also, you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question live, but um, if we are, uh, if there are no more questions that are coming in, I guess we can, uh, we can wrap this up. Give it a few more seconds. Bueller, anybody? Well, I would like to thank everybody for joining, especially over a lunch hour. Um, much appreciated. And if you do have questions, uh, please feel free to contact Morgan and, uh, and he can get, or your, uh, your sell point rep and they can get, get them to me. So thank you. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Mitch. And, and everyone, we will have this uh, video on demand. Um, so we'll be sending it around to all the participants and you can share it with anybody who was not able to make this call.
Um, with that said, I think we're going to wrap it up. So I wanted to thank everyone for joining the call. Mitch, I wanted to especially give you a big shout out and thanks for this presentation. Found it very interesting and uh, yeah, thank you so much for your support. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm the speaker, but there's a whole team behind it. And I, again, kudos to them, but Morgan, thank you. And thanks, thanks to Selfline. Great. Well, thanks everyone. And uh, that concludes the presentation today. Thanks everyone.